Well, this is going to be fun. Um, through my eBay selling, I, I offer some parts and I offer manuals through eBay. I ended up selling some motor brushes to a gentleman down in Florida, and he contacted me afterwards, and, and it was for a Husqvarna green machine. He contacted me after he received the brushes, and he said, these aren't going to fit. They're not going to work. I said, well, what's the problem? He goes, they're, they're too big. I said, I'll bet. I said, tell me what you have. He says, I have a Type 21. I said, I'll bet you you have a free Westinghouse motor in your machine, and it's not an original Husqvarna. And he goes, really? So he ended up, uh, we, we kind of broke away from that. He ended up taking the back of his uh, motor cover off calls me back and he goes, you're absolutely right. I said, it's interesting. I did a premiere on this a while back. The three different types of motors that Husqvarna used, the traditional one, a free Westinghouse one, and then they had a closed case motor as well. Do you all remember that premiere I did? Kind of highlighting those three different motors that Husqvarna has in their green machines. Well, John, and his last name is Smith, and I'm not making that up, John Smith ended up getting a machine that had that free Westinghouse motor, which takes a smaller brush than the regular Husqvarna Swedish motor. So we kind of developed a friendship through this uh, mishap of him having, having the wrong brushes, and I sent him the correct brushes, and then he started sharing some things about his life. He talked about his Navy time. He talked about working and retiring from NASA down in Florida, which is where he and his family live. And he, he shared that in working in the Navy, he was a, uh, a parachutist uh, and became a master parachutist rigger and uh, ended up putting together uh, parachutes using sewing machines aboard aircraft carriers. And he was on a variety of different aircraft carriers that he'll probably talk about during the interview. And then he went on after that, after he retired from the Navy, he went on to work for NASA and worked in their department where you know how when the space shuttles would land in that and also when the uh, solid boosters would separate, you'd see it on the, uh, the feed as they were showing the, the launch and everything, and then the parachutes would deploy and those huge rocket bo boosters would float back down to Earth. He was involved in making those parachutes. So he's had a very interesting life of having contact with sewing machines and sewing, and I said, John, I've got to interview you. And he's initially like, oh, I'm just a regular Joe. There's nothing special about me. But then he mentioned it to his family and to his wife. And they were like, no, 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 no. You definitely have something special to share. That might be John right there. Hey, John. Hey, Scott. I can see your, I can see your chest. <laughs> now I can see you. I was just sharing with the folks, and we're actually shooting live right now. I shared with them how we met uh, through you making an eBay purchase and getting the wrong motor brushes. And, I, and I, I asked my subscribers and my followers, I said, you remember that premiere I shot about a year ago highlighting the different motors that, the, that are in the Husqvarna green machines? I said, well, John and I met that way because he's got a free Westinghouse motor, and I sent him brushes for a traditional Swedish motor. And then he started sharing things about his background, working uh, in the Navy, working at NASA. And I said, I got to interview you. And I, I mentioned to them, I said, initially, you were real reluctant. You were like, oh, I'm just a regular Joe. And then your family and others kind of influenced you, said, no, you got a story to tell. You got a story to tell. But what I wanted to do first is honor you as a fellow veteran. So hold on a second. And yes, I'm standing up, out of respect. So that was a special thing I queued up just to acknowledge your naval service. And, uh... I guess what I'd like to start with, if you don't mind, is uh, I'll just kind of mention a couple of the things that you shared with me, and then you can uh, uh, feel free to, uh, to launch into whatever you want to share about them. You mentioned that you had served uh, 
in the Navy, hold on a second, I'm actually going to get even closer because I know that the volume was giving us a challenge when we kind of checked this out earlier. I'm going to get really, really close. There we go. We should be able to pick you up pretty good from there, I'm hoping. Otherwise, I'll take it off the tripod and we'll get really, really close. But uh, you mentioned that you had served in the Navy from 1962 to 1984. You went in when you were only 17 years old. And that you had, uh, you had spent the majority of your career when you were in the Navy uh, aboard various aircraft carriers. You mentioned the Constellation, the Ranger, the Enterprise, and the Saratoga. And uh, on most of those ships you were involved in one way or another using uh, sewing machines to do stuff. Can you share some of the details of what you were doing aboard ship with uh, the sewing and the machines? just general sewing for other divisions. But we always had a seven class. We always had at least one 111W-151 uh, stinger. We also had at least one 3115. And we always had a 143WSV-8, which is a double throw zigzag. And uh, there was usually a, you know, a, a second a walking foot machine of some sort involved in it. Uh, and I learned, I learned early on as a young sailor that uh, if you had a sewing machine, there was always a way to make an extra nickel uh, because somebody would want something sewed up or, you know, put, sew a stripe on a uniform or something. But also I learned that, you know, you've got to maintain these sewing machines and you've got to keep them sewing. Uh, and then we had people that uh, quite often would start out sewing and they'd have a problem with the machine and they would just go to another machine. Well, there was always one person, it seems like, in every command that was kind of set us, you know, there was the person they called to come fix it. And quite often it was me. And so I got, uh, you know, I got a good healthy dose of, of sewing machine uh, re repair and adjustments there. I also uh, remembered what they had taught me in A school that uh, they need to be oiled on a frequent basis. Sure, sure. You know, if you're in a saltwater environment, and I also found out the hard way that you don't want to over oil them. Just a drop of oil on the moving surfaces, uh, and that's that's adequate. Uh, but anyway, so that's that's kind of how all that started, and uh, I don't know. It, it seems like. Uh, I ended up fixing sewing machines for other people on occasion. Uh, and later on in my career, uh, I ended up going uh, back to Parachute River. I was a parachute river. And I ended up going back to the school to teach. And uh, while I was recovering from a parachute uh, injury to an ankle, I was in a cast, uh, they put me in the department that taught these young guys how to sew. And I was there for a little while, and then all of a sudden they detailed me down to the advanced school uh, to set up and, and teach sewing machine repair at the advanced level. And what that meant was we tore every machine down, completely down, tore the head down, and then put it back together. They learned how to troubleshoot it. Uh, you know, and thankfully these machines, especially the early machines, are all mechanical. You didn't have a lot of electrical stuff on them. I mean, you had a motor, but... It sure. wasn't computerized, and you didn't have a lot of different stitch patterns, and, and what we see on, on sewing machines today, it was all pretty basic. And so uh, with that, uh, you know, and I did that for, I guess, I guess I did that for about a year. And uh, then a man came in and relieved me. Uh, I got detailed to, to parachute operations, and he's this first-class parachute rigger by the name of Philip Calvert. C A L V E R T. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You had mentioned him. Yeah, I, he came in and took it over, and 
this guy was absolutely amazing. I was pretty good at it, but this guy was really good at it. You know, uh, and there are people that have the knack for sewing machine repair. There are people that have the knack for teaching. And uh, and I have a little bit of that, but I did, you know, not nearly to the level of you know, some of the people that I worked with. Some of the people that I worked with were absolutely amazing. Matter of fact, uh, Calvert put a book out for uh, for for use within the rate within yes within the parachute rigger rate on sewing machines. But anyway, so I know you know this the the whole sewing thing just kept on going, and I always found a way to have a commercial machine, and I always found a way to to make a little money with them. You know, otherwise, you know. Most people have them for pleasure or for making money. Commercial machines, they usually have to make money with. Sure. But uh, when I retired from the Navy in 1984, uh, I sent an application into Kennedy Space Center. You know, they had parachutes, big parachutes for the boosters. And uh, my wife kept on saying I was going to get hired there, and I was like, no, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, they hired me uh, as a parachute rigger and as a sewing machine mechanic, and which was really amazing. And I got out there, and that was a completely different world. Instead of having two or three uh, different kinds of machines, we probably had eight or ten different kinds of machines. And a lot of them were computerized, and it was just a whole new learning environment. Uh, you know, and it's... Uh, Sewing machines are uh, depends on how they're maintained and how they're used. Uh, if you have an operator that's, uh, I don't know, I want to say I don't want to say sloppy or whatever. They just, uh, you know, they want to run it flat out or you know, you know, sewing machines need a little tender love and care. I mean, it's uh, it as simple as that. So I don't know that that whole thing ended up very well for me. Uh, you know, and I, I wasn't anything special either. I, you know, I did all the things that I'd learned in the Navy. I, I knew how to go to work on time. I knew how to take orders. Uh, I knew how to, you know, I knew what it meant to uh, have a mission assigned and accomplish it. And those were all things that I learned as a young sailor. You know, I didn't, uh, those were all things that were, were passed on to me. So, I don't know, I, uh, I maintained... My story really isn't all that interesting. I was just another guy that, you know, that, that had an opportunity and, abs and and did something with it. That's all it was. It was just, uh, What's, you know, the space. Let me just ask you a question, John. What is, uh, going back to the Navy a little bit, um, you entered when you were only 17 years old. Did right. you did you have a vision of what you would be doing during the course of your career when you entered at seventeen, uh, or did you take a you basically ended up on a path and you're like how the how the heck did I get here and then uh, you discovered that you loved it and you were really good at it. Well, that is an interesting thing to begin with because I joined the Navy. Like you said, I was seventeen. I was not a real good student in school. And uh, so I was uh, 16 years old. I was I was done with school. I joined, like I said, so I joined the Navy. And my first choice was I wanted to be an aviation bosun's mate. And my second choice was I wanted to be an aviation ordnance mate. And uh, the guy who was filling out the paperwork says, you know, you'd probably be a pretty good parachute rigger. And I said, what's that? And he told me about it. And he said, you have to jump with the parachute you pack. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. And, uh, he says, "Well, I'll just put it down as your third choice, and then you'll, you'll get one of the other two for sure." Well, the orders came in. It was for parachute rigger. No surprise. Uh, yeah, he was. He was. He was. Uh, he was leading you down the path there a little bit. <laughs> I think. You know, in reality, I think I look at it, and I think he was my guardian angel. Sure. Because and I would have paid him money later on in life to change the parachute river, you know. But as it, as it turned out, uh, and, you know, the jumping, I uh, I said I didn't want to jump. Well, I ended up making a little over a 1,000 parachute jumps, you know, by the time I retired. Uh, I, You know, I had like 800 and some military jumps. And uh, 
I absolutely loved that world. But along with that world, also, there was the sewing. There was always the constant having to fix something. There was always something that needed to be replaced. It needed to be fixed. It needed to be sewed. And uh, and so then, you know, the, the sewing machines kicked in again. I remember going home on leave one time. I was home for 30 days leave. And my mother, I came through the door, and she says, oh, my God, I am so glad you're here. You're going to be here for a month. I said, yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, I'd be able to hang out with the guys, uh, hopefully not get in any trouble. But uh, Stay out of jail. Says, you know, <laughs> yeah. She says, I, got, I bought some material, and I want you to upholster the couch and the chair. Uh, and I'm like, what? And she had an old Singer treadle machine that she bought used in 1930. And that's what I upholstered the couch and the chair with, was that Singer treadle machine. By the time I got done, my right leg was hard like a bowling ball from operating that treadle. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But it, but it really, I'll tell you what, it looked good. Uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and later on in life, I've... Uh, I've always managed to, to, to spend time with sewing machines, making things. Uh, I'm also an avid golfer. I don't jump out of airplanes anymore. Uh, my back won't take it, and i got a pair of artificial knees. They won't take it. But, you know, I play golf, and so I started making leather head covers. And oh, neat. You, you name it, it seems like I've made it. I've made tonneau covers, boat covers, Postered cars, postered furniture, and though that back to that knowledge of the sewing machine, for me, that's a comfortable place. Sitting behind a sewing machine is a no-brainer. It's like uh, it's almost like meditation to me. It's just, it just, you know, there's nothing to it. Right now, I've got this. I don't know if you can see it or not. I got this uh, this ugly green Viking. Oh, sure. I say, I, I've got it tore apart. I'm waiting on those other brushes to come in. Uh, and I was thinking about this earlier today. I know you restore sewing machines. And when you get done with them, they look good. Well, thank you. And, uh, I'm, you know, restorations go in automotive. I really restored a car or two also, by the way. They go one of two ways. Either you just leave the patina on them that's on them or and you make them mechanically sound or you completely redo them do you completely redo the sewing machines and this one here is so ugly that it's beautiful <laughs> it's got, yeah, i don't know when it was made uh i can tell by the wiring on it that it hasn't been made in a long long time <laughs> but uh that's a type 21 it's a Type 21. Okay. It yeah. is a, it's a Type 21, and I watched one of your videos one day, and I learned where the serial number was. I, I, I couldn't find the serial number on that thing. Yeah, the, the, but, Swedish, the Swedish like to tuck things away, so... Yeah, well, I, I, I get part of that. I, I, I restored a couple of Swedish cars. I restored a couple of 1800s, Volvo 1800s. Oh, wow. But... Oh yeah, they were uh, they were gorgeous, uh, but it's like anything else. You get something real pretty, you don't want to drive it. You know, it's like buying a brand new truck. You don't want to put anything in the bed. You don't want to scratch the bed up. So, in my case, this uh, this sweetheart I have here, uh, I've also got a, a a walking foot. I got a a console two twenty six. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I use that on. A, almost a daily basis, and I use this one almost on a daily basis also. Uh, actually, this is my machine to go to because of the free arm on it. I've got the bed that goes with it, and it was interesting when I bought this, when I got this machine. My daughters found uh, this machine in a FOF, uh, commercial FOF, in a thrift store locally, and the lady wanted, uh, I think, $250 for the for the both of them. And I said, oh, I don't want the fob. I don't need it. I don't want it. It takes up too much space. And she <laughs> says, I said, I just want the, I just want the Viking. 
She says, oh, I won't sell you just one. you got to take them both. <laughs> so I did. I took them both. Sure. And I came home and I put a thread stand on the, on the, on the box. And I, you know, I took the pneumatics. That, it was in a commercial setting, obviously. I took the pneumatics off and just got everything set up. And I put it on Craigslist. And I think it was, I think I got $450 for it. Or oh, wow. Post. And the guy drove up from Miami to pick it up. He was real happy to get it. And uh, in the meantime, I got the green machine. The green's my favorite color, I'm telling you. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's such a pretty uh, pretty green on those uh, Swedish beauties, too. Yeah. Well, this one is a Swedish beauty, but you can tell it's got miles on it. Yeah, well, those are... Those are sewing scars, and those are, it's almost like having a tattoo as a sewing machine. You can tell your story of where you've been and what you've done, and yeah, so it, fit, it fits you to a T. Well, it really does fit me to a T, you know, and uh, it's, uh, one of the things I really like about it is, if you can get something under the pressure foot, it's more than likely going to sew it. Sure. You know, if you can just, if you can get it under there, and, uh. There's a lot of other machines out there, commercial machines available, older machines that just won't do that. You know, I I always I always had a, a preference. I always liked 111W151s and 3115s. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it seems like anymore you can't find one, uh, not a decent one anyway. But uh, like I said, this one you can do just about anything on it. I can sew. I sew leather on it. Oh yeah, easy. I sold leather with you know. The only thing is, it's got to be where the motor was real tired. Uh, once you got once you got it going, it was okay. But starting always required a little assist, little assistance to it. And I'm hoping the new brushes take care of that. If not, I'm going to have to chase down another motor or send the. Maybe I'll chase one down through you. Well, I'd be glad to help. I've I've done a number of machine motor restorations and it makes a world of difference so you know, also there's a there's these little uh, it looks like they're, they're plastic or something feet underneath the underneath the base plate four of them four white ones on the bottom of the machine yeah on the bottom of the machine yeah I, i'm gonna have to talk to you later on about sending me some of those too yeah, if I if I have some extra ones, I, I certainly would. Um, there's also I'll, I'll I'll share with you some things once we get done. Uh, alternatives too that work real well. So, but yeah, yeah those I, those tend to deteriorate after a while. They just kind of get brittle and fall apart. So. Yeah, I uh, I thought about alternatives, but uh, and you know, taking uh, keeping in mind that this is not a restored machine. This is an operational daily use machine. It doesn't make any difference what's underneath it. Sure. It doesn't affect it. But, so uh, let me let me uh, let me ask you a quick question about uh, you had mentioned when we chatted and we're kind of getting ready for this uh, that you had seen some action aboard one of the aircraft carriers. Uh, can you share a little bit about that? Yes, I was uh, I was on the Enterprise in. Uh, January 14th, 1969, in the parachute loft, uh, which is on the O3 level, right directly underneath the flight deck. And uh, we had this uh, this horrific fire and explosions, bombs going off. It was, uh, you know, the military is always hurry up and wait, and some boredom followed by just periods of sheer terror, and that's what that was. Uh, you know, myself and some of the other guys in the shop ended up on the flight deck after the bombs were not blowing up, but there was still fires and stuff going on. We ended up there on fire hoses, you know, trying to get fires out and stuff. It was a, it was a pretty traumatic thing. And that was my, I think that, that was my third deployment. So I'd gotten very complacent about, it. you know, it's just nothing but a, you know, a, a small city, 3,000 people or so. Well, it's not that. It's you know, it's a, it's a, it's 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 a man of war. It's uh, you know, that's uh, loaded up with things that are going to hurt you. So, uh, you know, and it's amazing that uh, 
it's amazing how fast everything can go south, so to speak. Uh, well, share some of those there. share some of those details, John, because a lot of people might not know what actually happened, what caused the explosion, and what caused caused the well, fires. The explosion was caused by a Huffer, which was an aircraft starting unit, which was parked directly underneath uh, a rack of, of, of some rockets. Okay. And everything was on because we were. This happened at like I guess about two minutes to eight in the morning. And we were getting ready for an operational readiness exercise in ORE. We were off the coast of Hawaii. We were going to Vietnam. And uh, they had some delays. And what happened was the exhaust from that huffer cooked off some of the rockets. Well, they went across the deck and hit an aircraft on the other side, which was loaded with, you know, 250-pound bombs. And those were armed. And so things just started exploding. And uh, there was a hole in the flight deck that was big enough to take a tractor trailer, grab it by the nose on the end of the, of the, of the tractor, and drop the whole thing down into the ship. Uh, it was, uh, and you know what, if we hadn't been getting ready, everybody knew that we had this exercise coming up. And so everybody was manning their battle stations. And had they not already, they were probably 80%, 90% manned, we could have been in real trouble. Oh sure. But as it turned out, as it turned out, you know, Divine Province, uh, that was uh, that was it. it you know, we lost a bunch of people. We lost a bunch of people. But they took us into the yards at Pearl Harbor, and it was uh, six weeks later. They had that flight deck repaired. They had the compartments repaired, ninety uh, percent anyway. And we were back at sea. We went to Vietnam. So it. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, like I said, it's just amazing how fast everything happens. And if you're aboard a ship, I know at the time, I don't know how they do it today, but, you know, on an aircraft carrier, at least four-stall class carriers, they had two foot, two shell hulls. They had one in forward and one aft. And the one aft, the one forward was right up by some magazine uh, elevators. And stuff would come up out of the magazines, bombs, rockets, and sort of stuff. And that would be sitting there, and you'd be eating right around all this organs that's sitting there. And we all got used to it. It was normal. You know, and I look back at it today and I'm going, huh. That was crazy. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but you know, but you know, that's, uh, you know, and I was on the, I was on the Saratoga. We made a, we got an emergency recall. We ended up going to, to Vietnam for a year. Uh, well, we were gone for, we were there for, I think, for 11 months. We were gone. And by the time you do the trans transfer time, it comes out to be in about a year. Uh, and we had a fire. We were in port, and I can't really remember where it was. It could have been Hong Kong, but they had a, a fire in the engine room. And uh, it was bad enough where I, I remember feeling that the deck was really warm, and the tile was getting a little squishy. That's how hot it was. Uh Wow. But you know, it, it's just, uh, it's a dangerous environment. By the same token, uh, we're all young, hard charging, you know, it doesn't make any difference. You know, and later on when I got involved in the parachute world, when I got involved in the jumping out of the airplanes. Sure. That absolutely consumed my life. <laughs> That's, that was absolutely the most fun a man is allowed to have legally. And I'm sure there's other ways you can have that much fun, but I don't know what it would be. But uh, it was just, uh, it was just something that just, it was, it, it was wonderful. You'd wake it up was, and you'd wake up and you'd go, wait a second, I'm actually getting paid to do this? What? Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and that was, I, I remember saying, I would actually, you know, I would pay money to do this. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the, the Navy, the Navy was a wonderful thing for me because I had somewhat of a troubled youth. I got in a, a fair amount of trouble as a teenager, and I grew up in a small town in, in western Michigan, Fremont, Michigan. And uh, I, I grew up there, and if you grow up in a small town and you get in any trouble, you can pretty much forget employment in that little town, I can guarantee you that. Well, the military ended up being a really equal opportunity employer. 
if you're willing to put in the time and the effort, you were going to be okay. Uh, at least the Navy was. So, I don't know. I, I enjoyed my time in there. By the same token, when it was time for me to retire, my wife was uh, sick and tired of the whole deal. We'd been married for 21 of the 22 years. Sure, sure. It, we're still married. We got married in 1963. And he, anyway, she was sick and tired of it. And uh, our oldest daughter had gotten married. And so we ended up coming to Florida. And uh, Well, and having, I, like, yeah, I mean, people don't realize that either. That's a real important point to, to mention. That's why they finally, they finally had a clue and they set up rear detachment supports for the family members when the uh, the soldiers, the airmen, the sailors were away because a huge amount of stress. All of a sudden that person that was sharing the load is gone, they're out of the picture and and the wife and sometimes even the kids have to pitch in, you know, to, to try to keep things, keep the wheels turning. Absolutely, and that was before, before you had uh, the internet or anything like that. So, you know, the correspondence, I would write a letter in two weeks to get to to her, she would write her letter and it would take two weeks to get to me, uh, you know, and uh, it was just, it was, it was a hard environment to keep a family together. I had a lot of friends that uh, their marriages did, just didn't make it, and uh, I don't know if it was because we were too dumb to get a divorce, I don't know what the deal was. Uh, I know this much that uh, we always, uh, we had each other to, to to, to, to lean on. We were never stationed anywhere where there was any family around to take either side of whatever was going on. Whether, sure. You know, and so we had to we, we had to sort things out, and we learned how to do that. Uh, well, and know, it's sometimes and sometimes better not having anybody there that can kind of meddle in things and be there trying to offer advice when you need to you need to talk as a couple and figure things out. You really do, and you know it's not. It's you said it's uh, sometimes it's better. It's always better if you you know to do it yourself. It really is, you know. Uh, and I'm not saying that counseling is a bad thing. No, oh, no, not at all. I think everybody in life, at some time or another, needs some sort of counseling. I mean, I certainly have had my share of it over the years. But, sure. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, it, it it is what it is. It's, uh, but you know, for me, the military was a way out. Had I stayed where I was at and kept on what I was doing, uh, I'm absolutely positive that would have not turned out well. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, John. Going back to NASA, um, how many years were you at NASA again? I think I was there for 13, 14, 15, something like that. I went in as I was, uh, I hired in as a parachute rigger and solar machine mechanic. Yeah. And when I I was the manager of the parachute facility. And, just, uh, I was just going to say, so, de describe, uh, as, as you go into that a little bit, describe a little bit more, if you would, about the types of projects that you would have there at NASA. I know that you had mentioned making the big parachutes, but what? Wh how do you pull all that together? You know, when you started and you were doing it and then you became a manager, what does a project look like? How long does it take? How many um, how many machines? How many men? Uh, how many hours? You know, any of that you could share would be awesome. Yeah, well, we didn't actually make the parachutes. So we did really make some re make some replacement panels. Uh, and, you know, we did that, and everything is done in sections. You uh, and these parachutes were 136 feet in diameter. Uh, they were just you know. They were, wait, 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 wait! Say, say that again. How big? 136 feet in diameter. That's huge. That's it. And each booster had three of those parachutes. So the parachutes would uh, would fly, and then when they came back, they would be wet with salt water, and so they kept them soaked. So when we got them, we would have to wash them and dry them. And we had a big a big dryer that we rolled them in on a monorail. We put them in a, in a big wash tank, held 30,000 gallons on a monorail. We'd wash them, and then we'd put them in the dryer. And after they came out of the dryer, they had to be inspected. Every panel, and they were ribbon parachutes, every panel, every ribbon has got to be looked at, and it's got to be checked for damage. And 
whatever damage is found, is, then it's going to be repaired by a technician. And we did, uh, we made all of the suspension elements. We made risers, we made uh, dispersion, dispersion line. We made everything. Uh, we did it all. We did it with, uh, well, we had a seven class for a while. When I first got there, we had some 97 tens, which were, they were, they were uh, really old and had extended arms and they, they didn't work well. We ended up getting a, a big Adler 120 for the real heavy stuff. But we used a lot of Adler four, uh, 467s. We had some Adler arm machines. We had some, you know, 30-inch arms. We, had, we just had a large variety and a lot of them. And they all had computers on them. And they all had uh, automatic thread cutting. And so the technician that sat down to it didn't have to hold the threads when they started sewing. They could just start sewing. And when they got done with the stitch pattern they were sewing, they heeled back on the treadle and it would automatically cut the thread, raise the presser foot, and they could just go on to the next one. When they got to the next one, they just touched the treadle and down the presser foot would come and you could start sewing again. So they're very, very, they're wonderful machines. But as far as a sewing machine mechanic, there's too many moving parts at them. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, <laughs> well, we, we had talked about that. Those Adlers, we just we just had an Adler a couple weeks back, four or five weeks back, arrive at the workshop. And, uh, you know, it, it's just packed. It's packed. There's every every millimeter of that machine. There's... You better pull your elbows and your feet in if you're going to work on that thing because there's just nowhere to go with it. And uh, the you know the most fascinating thing about the Adler that came to the workshop is as as I presented it to folks, I did it as an unboxing. You know, we're looking at that Western Germany uh, engineering. It's just built like a tank. And then we turn the machine around. We're kind of walking around the machine, looking at it, checking for damage. And the motor and the foot controller are made in my old hometown of Racine, Wisconsin. Yeah. And they're original. But that, you know, yeah. it just goes back to the show how they did like the swapping, the horse trading, you know, between the sewing machine manufacturers, just like with the Husqvarna's, you know, F Free Westinghouse got involved and there were others that got involved in, you know, doing different things to make that machine a reality. Yeah. Yeah, that... Uh I noticed that about, uh, like you said, everything was packed in there. Uh, my first, the first thing I encountered, I, I you know, I was going to go change a needle, and I, you know, grab my normal stuff, and I get there, and I'm like, you have to have an Allen wrench to change a needle in a 467. Because <laughs> it's all there with an Allen wrench, I'm, with an Allen head screw. And I'm like, hmm, that's the first thing I'm discovering that I wasn't fond of. But now, you know, they were, they were wonderful machines, and they performed well. Uh, and like I said, you know, the and not only did we work on the parachutes and we pack the parachutes and we uh, we go over and and do the installation, uh, do the hookup of them uh, on the top of the booster, but we also took care of the parachute that was in the back of the shuttle, uh, and that that was an orbit the drag parachute. When that was first uh, presented to NASA. It was presented as a one-time usage item. It, real quick, John, to ask a question. Is that the one that would kick out of the back of it when it landed? Absolutely. Or that was an over the drag shoe. That's right. Okay. Okay. And uh, we had, you know, the guy that I, I was a technician at the time, uh, may have been a lead, the, the manager had done some, some, some talking and convinced everybody that we could refurbish those those parachutes for, you know, probably two or $3,000 compared to, you know, $60,000 plus or whatever to replace it every flight. And so we started doing that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was just, uh, you know, it was doing innovative things like that. Uh, you know, and not only we did that, we did general sewing for everybody at the Space Center. You know, somebody would need some some bumper pads made for whatever project they were working around or whatever, and they'd come over with some drawings or an idea, and uh, we would make it. And, you know, it, uh, and I think the most talented group of people ever assembled. And most of those people came out of either the boat canvas world or the military. 
people that do boat canvas work are used to doing precise work and having it seen, and that's important. Upholstery people, quite often, they can hide their mistakes with uh, foam or whatever. Well, you can't be doing that stuff with boat stuff. Anyway, so, uh, and I worked with a guy by the name of Scott Brady. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 I remember you mentioning him. Yeah, and, and Scott uh, was a parachute rigger, and uh, he, you know, and he worked with me for a while and got the ins and outs of, you know, of sewing machines, and he always had a lot of commercial machines himself. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm looking at a MacGyver. I'm looking at a guy that can make anything so. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and like I said, it's, uh, you know, he had that, he had that talent. And uh, Phil Calvert had that talent. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a gift. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so the, you know, the thing at the Space Center was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. Uh, Let me ask you a quick question, John. Uh, with the sewing you did at the Space Center, you did a combination of project-based stuff, and then you said other stuff just kind of kind of flew into the mix of things, like the bumpers and other things like that. Talk about the materials that you were working with, if you would, and the thicknesses. People are always, uh, I'm always getting feedback because when a machine gets done here at the workshop, I don't just pack it up and ship it out the door. I always demonstrate uh, through very detailed confirmation sew-offs what the machine can do, the quality of the stitch and that sort of thing. So could you talk a little bit about the materials that you guys were using and uh, what kind of thicknesses are we talking about? We, uh, we operated, it was mainly, we used uh, just tons and tons of nylon. And uh, some of the stitch patterns would be, uh, it, would be it would be a half an inch of nylon uh, sewed with a six cord on a 120 or three cord, you know, is it, you know and you're sewing, it, uh, sewing a, a four point stitch pattern or sometimes a six point stitch pattern. And uh, that's just something that, uh, you know, that just, you know, you're going to have to have a big machine to do. But the majority of it was done with uh, E-thread or double F. And it was, uh, you know, at uh, six, you know, usually about six stitches per inch. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it was just, you know, it was just, you know, towards the end, we started using, we started dealing with a lot of Kevlar and Spectra. And we were working with that. Uh, there was always an engineering project going on, which I was involved in sometimes. Always an engineering project going on. And uh, one of the things they were trying to figure out is how to marry nylon and Kevlar together. And the problem is nylon's got a 28 to 30% stretch factor. Sure, sure. Kevlar's got no stretch. Yes. And so you start putting a load on it, uh, something's going to give. Uh, we couldn't get, uh, if we used Kevlar thread, it would pull, it would physically pull through the nylon. It would just shred it. Just cut right if through. Nylon, right. If we used nylon thread, it would simply just tear. It wouldn't hold. So we had to come up big. And, uh, you know, some guys, uh, Scott Brady and Dale Boyer, who was an engineer, and, uh, Dave Hildebrandt, another engineer, and, you know, I was involved in a lot of that. We, you know, we worked and worked and worked. We figured out how you to marry those two materials up. Uh, and I thought it was ironic. I was watching the, the last space uh, when they brought the capsule back, the, the, new, the new vehicle, and they did an interview with Elon Musk, and he said, parachutes are, are hard. Parachutes are difficult. And I'm like, huh. They are difficult. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It's, you know, the whole world has changed. Uh, they don't use parachutes to bring down boosters anymore. They bring them back and land them on their tail. Do uh, they? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They fly their boosters. They fly them back and land them. They either land them on a, ro on a, a robotic uh, barge out in the ocean or they land them back at the space center. And I, I see that going on and I'm like, you know, I had an engineer, George Hinkle, told me that about, I guess, about 25, 30 years ago. He says, you know, in the future, they won't be using parachutes to bring down boosters. I'm like, you're kidding me, George. He says, oh, no, they'll land them. 
Like, yeah, right, George, you're high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he got maybe he got the vision when he was high. Who knows? But uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. But you know, there was a, a crew of people. There was a guy that was an engineer by the name of Bob Monroe. And, uh, and all of these guys either had civilian skydiving and parachute manufacturing experience or they were military riggers. And uh, that was the talent pool that uh, just kind of kept things going. They just kept things going. A really good crew of people. What, uh, uh, what? The best uh, of worked with them. At, at NASA, you were there, uh, you know, 13, 14, 15 years, whatever it was. What was what's what's the most interesting story you can tell about? You started out on a project and and you had to change directions or or something just interesting that happened that was totally unexpected, but you got through it. Oh, oh we were always changing directions, <laughs> trying to figure out how to make something work. We had a we had a tinius Olson, and uh, it's to check the tensile strength of, of of materials and what are you working on, and. Uh, I was pulling some material one day, and uh, the bitter end of it went right up through the locking channel in the top and blew the top of it out and broke a fluorescent light above it. And so they call, safety's got to get involved, safety's involved, everything's shut down. We make this special cage for it, we do all this. And about a month and a half later, the safety people are in the parking lot. They had just given us the okay to start doing it again. Launched another one right through the same hole. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Took out another light. And this time, safety didn't get called. <laughs> the boss decided, well, uh, I think that light was initially damaged before. So I'm just going to go ahead. <laughs> but it was... You know, and, and what we were doing, we were pulling connector links. We were trying to see what what the tensile strength of a parachute connector link would come apart at, because we needed that information. Sure. And uh, we found out they were a lot stronger than we thought they were. But uh, no, it was a good. You know, I, I take a look at that, and I the the, the Navy uh, gave me a place to grow up. And. Uh, Kennedy Space Center was just a lot of fun. It was a lot, well, let's put it this way. It was a lot of fun when I was a technician. It was a lot of fun when I was a leaf. It was still a lot of fun when I was a supervisor. But by the time I became the manager, it wasn't quite as much fun. You know, I'm, I'm no longer dealing with uh, the people and the parachutes and the hardware. And I'm start, starting to have to deal with things that I'm not really all that comfortable with. Pushing paper and pencils, probably, huh? Yeah, and being a politician, so to speak, you know. Uh, it, I don't know. It just uh, it didn't suit me. It didn't. It didn't. It wasn't a good personality fit for me. But I tell you what, I look back at that, and I look back at the people that I worked with. What a blessing! There was a, the crew, unbelievable, dedicated. They could. They could. You know, give them a task give them the paperwork, and just let them do it, you know? You didn't have to step in there and watch them. You know, of course, we had quality checks everywhere, quality checks built into everything. But uh, you didn't have to, you know, hound people and say, hey, is this going to be done in time? No, it always, it was, you know, it always got done. And, uh, and it was done professionally and done right. That's the important part. Did you, uh, did you have a chance to meet any... Um Big shots uh, when you were at the Kennedy Space Center, and who the, who were they? I uh, you know I, I met a, a bunch of astronauts, and to be honest with you, I don't remember their names. Sure, they would come through the facility all the time, and we'd give them a tour. And it'd be usually myself or you know we would give them a, a good tour. But I don't know by then they had probably you know twenty five or thirty astronauts. There was always somebody in training, and it was just uh, and. And I'm not saying it was a distraction, but it was just, you know, we always had a mission to accomplish, and that was just something we did extra. It was a, it was just a very interesting, it was a very interesting career. You know, and I, 
you know, I look, I look back at it, and I look back at the Navy. The Navy was really special because it took a 17-year-old child and uh, forced him to grow up. I had some attention deficit disorders in school. I wasn't going to learn in that setting. But you give me something mechanical. Give me something I can look at. I can see the gears working. I can see a needle bar going up and down. I can see where the, th where the thread is getting picked up by the hook. Now, I could do that. That, it, that interested me. And uh, I was just very fortunate that, that, I got, that I was able to make a living at it. Be honest with you. Over the years, um, I should say over the decades, NASA has sometimes fallen under scrutiny and there's been budget cuts and there's been Congress has fought as far as approving monies to do certain things. Did you ever find that any of that, any of that side of the politics, either when you were a rigger or when you moved into a management role, did it ever impact what you were trying to do in your job there? No, it really didn't. Uh our budget was pretty solid because they had to have the they had to have the, the boosters to put the, the shuttle off, and they had to have the parachutes to recover the boosters. I actually had a, a man say to me one time, a, a manager out there say, "Well, what's the big deal? The parachutes don't all work, you know, right?" And I'm like, well, "How many boosters do you have?" And if you take, you say you got 15, you got 14 boosters, you got seven flights. If you lose those, you're you're in trouble. Uh, so, yeah, but our budget was always pretty solid, and uh, if we had anything special going on, we, we got funding for it. Uh, they, they took pretty good care of us. Uh, it was, uh, I didn't have any of those battles. Uh, it seemed like there was, uh, there were other things always going on. There was other always distractions. There was, uh, you know, especially once I became the manager, I, uh, it was amazing. I never even, I never put in for the job. And I went into work one day, and the guy that was the manager, Bruce Rutledge, and said, I'm going back to engineering. And I said, what? And he said, yeah. He says, you're going to be the manager. And I'm like, huh? Surprise! <laughs> he says, well, you've, already been, you've been doing the job already, son. You, now it's going to be official. I'm going, what? <laughs> I thought he was messing with me. But uh, now it, uh, it all turned out well. It turned out good in spite of me. Well, and, and because of you, too, obviously. Uh, yeah, you, you see yourself as ordinary, but I'm sure you did a lot of extraordinary things uh, in the Navy and with NASA when you were there. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure that the, I'm sure it made a big difference. Uh, I had uh, one, of my, one, of the, one of my tours in the Navy, I was with EOD Group 1 in Hawaii. And... Uh, which was a lot of fun because they get to do a lot of neat stuff, you know. And I was I was the master parachutist for that command. And uh, the commanding officer, a guy, a man by the name of uh, Ted McCarley, had said to me, he said, uh, "I want you uh, to to come up with a way where we can put a boat uh, with a motor and everything out the door of an airplane and a bunch of jumpers and put them in the water." And I'm going like, "Huh?" And uh, <laughs> So, but he gave me everything I needed to do it, and I developed something we called the Pick Pack, the Parachute Insertion Capable Package. Uh, and it was a, a rubber boat, and in the middle of it was a, a hard container that was uh, lashed down in the middle of it. Uh, in that hard container was uh, uh, outboard motor and gas and a transom, and it all went into the soft container, and it we would push this thing out the side of a P3 at uh, about 140 knots, and then we would follow it. And it would hit the water, and the parachute would open up, and the container would open up, and the CO2 would inflate the rubber boat, and it would land with this equipment container in the middle of it. And we would hit the water and get the container open, get the transom out, put it on the rubber boat, and put the motor on the rubber boat, on it, and hook the gas up and be underway in about five minutes. Uh, and that was just, that was so much fun. It was a lot of work, but it, God, that was fun. And I remember we went, uh, myself and uh, Commander McCarley, who was a skipper at the time, we went and we had to meet with uh, an admiral. 
at Barber's Point uh, to get permission to use one of his P3s. Hmm. And uh, he said, what are the chances? Is this something going wrong? And I said, ah, it's going to work like a champ. And we walked out of there, and my skipper says, you didn't tell him what could go wrong. I said, he didn't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, it, as it turned out, uh, that was actually used... Uh, on a mission uh, off of the coast of Japan that was actually used once. But, you know, that was some of the fun stuff that that I got to do. Uh, and, of course, it was work. But, and of course, it was work. But, you know, here's the thing. If you really enjoy what you're doing, it's not nearly as much work. And sometimes sometimes it doesn't even feel like work. It feels like I'm I'm no. playing. I'm playing. <laughs> And I'm sure you had the same experiences. I never did find out how you got involved in sewing machines. Uh, yeah, you I'm, told me about them. yeah, my 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 pilgrimage started actually working uh, working with cars uh, with my father, and uh, he when he uh, I think I told you a little bit about the story of mom and dad, and actually dad's birthday, or what would have been his birthday. He would have been turning ninety this year. Uh, if he hadn't passed away, uh, and uh, you know, when it came to growing up as a, a kid in Wisconsin, you know there were different things that you could do. But I was was most most content and most intrigued by what Dad was doing out in the garage, and um, he would have our vehicles out there. Sometimes sometimes he would have a neighbor's vehicle out there, and he'd be doing different things to try to you know, troubleshoot or resolve a problem. And I always wanted to be right in the middle of that. And, uh, you know, whether it was bleeding brakes or adjusting carburetors or, you know, any of that work that many folks these days, they would, they would never conceive of doing it. And some cars don't even, you know, don't require it anymore. But, uh, but I would spend hours and hours and hours uh, through the 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 bone chilling winters out in the garage with dad and and then developed an interest in auto mechanics and started started tinkering on my own car tinkering on other cars and then as i got older and could buy more expensive toys started tinkering on exotic cars and uh realized that i enjoyed uh, kind of like you enjoyed the mechanics of it enjoyed seeing things uh uh, work that had not been working quite right before making those fine-tune adjustments and and uh, and then just kind of migrated over to smaller uh, machines and uh, you know I would take apart radios I would take apart phonographs I would um, you know tinker on different things around the house even tried working on the microwave I remember when I was a young teenager and that was a that was a brand new technology that I probably shouldn't have been tinkering on, but uh, but yeah, it's just it was one of those subtle things where step by step by step um, they were all preparing me, you know that providential pre preparation of uh, eventually having a need arise and being able to step in and make a difference for that sewing machine that belonged to a family member, belonged to a friend, and get that feedback from them that it, it didn't, you know, it, whatever it was, it, you know, the issue, it, it, didn't, it didn't sew as well as this when I first got it, was some of the feedback I got, which was kind of a shot in the arm and, you know, that sense of encouragement that I'm sure you got as well with some of the different projects that you took yeah. on. Yeah. And it builds your confidence and it builds your curiosity. And... Um, it just continued to grow and grow and grow. I, I often relay this story, but uh, right behind where you probably can't see, I could turn, I could turn the, the phone around and you'd be able to see. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I don't know if I have it aiming the right way or not, but uh, right behind where we've been talking and having this great visit in this uh, uh, is uh, Herr Obermeister, Mr. Bean, and an 1885 Singer uh, 12K hand crank that I just gave away in a contest. Uh -huh. And and I, I can't see if I have it. Do I have it aimed the right way? Yeah, I see. Okay. I see uh, but my point in, in showing this is I never imagined when I started this 
20 plus years ago that uh, it would grow into something like this. I never conceived of it. I remember when I first went onto YouTube and I, I got 100 subscribers, I thought that that was the cat's meow. How could it get any better than this? And, uh, and then things just continued to uh, uh, grow and grow and grow, and then it was 1,000, and, and this particular machine I was just showing you that I'm, I'm finalizing right now to send out to Pennsylvania to Mary Klein. Mary Klein got involved in one of the contests and wrote a, a wonderful piece and the whole piece was centered around, you may have seen some of this, uh, it was all centered around uh, Bill O'Rourke, who works as a moderator with me, along with Hans Christian from Norway. And we were, we were doing a contest around the founding of Kissimmee, Florida, and uh, the significance of that area. I always say Kissimmee, but we were, we were building a contest around Kissimmee or Kissimmee, Florida, talking about the steamboat captain... Uh, that was involved in the founding of the town and how he named it uh, Mary, I think it was Mary Bell. He named his, uh, his steamboat Mary Bell and then invited people to build a, 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 a fact slash fictional story around all these facts of the founding of Kissimmee. And uh, Mary Klein came up with a beauty. She came up with a beauty. There was a tavern named after me and Hans was in the story and Bill was in the story and it was just, it was a hoot. It was a hoot, so... So I'm, uh, I'm in the final phases now of getting, re getting ready to uh, do a premiere of this uh, 1885 uh, uh, hand crank and then ultimately ship it out to this, uh, this great lady that uh, you know, wrote this fantastic story uh, about, you know, about all of these, you know, the founding of Kissimmee, all of us, and, and tied even tied the machine into the story as well. It was it was a beautiful job. Yeah, you know, you, uh, you said your father tinkered on cars. My father was a my father was a butcher, and uh, so in my spare time, if there was some of that sort of work, uh, it wasn't. Uh, gee, I think I'm going to go play basketball. I'm going to go play hockey. Or I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to do that. It was like. Uh, you're boning beef, uh, or you're helping process a couple hundred chickens. Uh, and I, I figured out early in life, I didn't want to do that for a living. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, I can't hardly stand to cut up a chicken. My wife, you know, she's a southern girl. She's from Girl Beach, Florida. Her family came in here well over a hundred years ago. And uh, she likes chicken. And I'm like, well... Here's the deal. You're going to get to cut it up because I don't like cutting eggs. I don't like the smell of it. I, you know, you get that smell on you and it takes a couple of days for it to get off. Yeah, yeah. I had a, um, I had a sister-in-law uh, and a brother-in-law that had a farm and they would, at, at family gatherings for Christmas and that, they would want to get very graphic, very graphic about their chickens and how they harvested them and how they turned them inside out and they just went into some details I would usually just politely walk away because if if I heard anything more I probably would never eat chicken again and certainly yeah. wouldn't want to you know wouldn't want to be in in any phase of processing this stuff it was just uh yeah it was it, I I yeah, totally my, relate I totally relate my mother's my mother's family my mother was uh was Danish her last name was Peterson and uh, they were all farmers. All the men were farmers and all the women were teachers because you had to have some source of steady income coming in because, you know, farming in western Michigan wasn't all that proper at the time. But, uh, yeah, I know, I, I, I know about that sort of stuff. I had an uncle that had this pair of geese that were just, well, I'll tell you what, they were the meanest things you've ever seen in your life. And we went there one year for, for, uh, for Thanksgiving and there was goose on the menu. And I noticed those geese weren't running around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and then you've got you hear the stories about the kids on the farm that kind of want to make them pets, and then all of a sudden pets become part of the dinner plan. And yeah, Absolutely. it's interesting, interesting dynamics. But uh, if, well, you don't, don't you don't name farm animals because when you name them, you're going to want to keep them. 
Well, you did you did a lot of sewing in the Navy. Um, you know, just a wide thing, a wide scope of things, everything from the parachutes to uh, projects, you know, like you said, sewing on rank and stuff like that for folks in that. NASA, you're involved with uh, making parachutes and other projects that come your way. Um, now you're retired. You're retired and you're, uh, you love golfing and you love uh, tinkering on your machines there. Do you have any projects going on with your machines right now that, uh, that uh, you're, you're, you want to share with I folks? Got, I've got to uh, make some head covers. I have a, uh, ran into a, a gentleman that owns a, a lot of he owns a large company with a lot of embroidery machines. Uh, and uh, he is also a golfer. And he says, you know, you and I are going to make some money here. And I'm like, oh, what that means is I'm going to do a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it that usually works out, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I just managed to stay busy. I, I, you know, uh, I always find something that, that needs to be done. I said, I have a, one of my, I have three grandsons. And the middle grandson has got, uh, he's got, he's got the bug. Matter of fact, he went out and bought himself, uh, bought his own machine. Uh, you know, and he's, uh, he's, I taught him how to sew on my console. And for his final project, he made himself uh, a leather backpack. Uh, with my leather, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, and it was, I, I couldn't believe it. It was absolutely, you know, he did the zippers himself. He did everything himself. And, you know, and it, and it just it, it came out gorgeous. He's got the touch. And he's got the, the, it takes an imagination in order to think of something and lay it out and then put it together and actually have it come out. That sure. takes imagination. And, uh, and he's got that. Well, and, you know? it takes, and it takes discipline. And how, how old is he again? He is, uh, he just had his 24th birthday. Okay, still a young guy then. Uh, 24, well, maybe he's 25, I don't know. It's been, that's what happens when you get old, you start to forget stuff. <laughs> you know, the oldest grandson, his career army, been in the army for 10 years. Uh, and then uh, middle grandson works for a local DOD contractor. And the youngest grandson uh, works in a local window tending shop. And he's another one. He's both these, these younger two are just, they're, they're really bright. They're just brilliant. Uh, and they both got imagination. Uh, they both, you know, they, they've got it. They, they got, but the middle one that sells, I'm going like, every time he comes over, he's robbing, uh, oh, Pop, you don't happen to have some extra webbing, do you? Or, you know, do you still have any of that gray, slate gray leather that I really like? And I'm like, <laughs> 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 buy your own hide of leather. Find out how much that cost. Give him a yeah. Give him a gift card to the fabric store, you know, and just go on. Go you know, go get your own stuff. That's another thing. Him and I have been, to, you know, we go to Joe. I, we've both been to Joe Ann Fabrics, you know. So how many guys do you find in there that are buying stuff for themselves? Let's be honest. Uh, but I don't know. It's uh, I can't complain. It's been I've been blessed way beyond what I deserve. Believe me. Well, that's the whole essence of a blessing is it's undeserved favor. So that's true of that's true of everybody that I've ever met that's wise enough to recognize it for sure. So Well, I I'm not, not successful on my own merit, I can tell you that. Uh, did you have did you have anything else you wanted to show the folks as far as your uh, machines or anything like that that you kind of set up behind you or uh, well, I've got I've got this uh, I got this, this the green machine, and you notice the back is off it. The motor is exposed, and uh, I'm waiting on the brushes to come in. And it dawned on me I was doing. I thought, well, maybe they'll be here today. Then it dawned on me it's Labor Day. Post yeah. Office isn't going to be and that's okay because I don't have anything pressing that's got to be done. And if it did, it would take me about five minutes to put it all back together, hook it up, and get it and start sewing. Sure, sure. That's yeah, I dropped those in the mail. So yeah, apart from the Labor Day weekend, uh, they should get there. I'm guessing by, well, you, you United States Postal Service has been criticized, I think, justifiably because I do a lot of business with them, and they've really been off their game. So really, 
normally I would say it's, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they'd be there by tomorrow, but the way they've been running, uh, you might not see them until Wednesday or yeah. you never know. I, had, I had some golf stuff uh, coming and it was supposed to be here on the 28th and it finally got here uh, five days late and it was sent priority mail. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. So my, you know, so any bad press they're getting, I have a feeling they they deserve it. They do. They absolutely do. Hey, one one last wrap up question, and I'm very grateful for your time, by the way. Uh, but you had shared with me, I think, off camera, that your favorite personal sewing machine is definitely your Husqvarna, your Viking. Uh, absolutely. What what do you what? Because I have a lot of folks that love the Swedish beauties. What what attributes of the machine? I, I know you said you you put any you can, you get anything underneath the presser foot. It's probably going to sew it. But apart from that, what else do you like about that machine? Well, I, I really like the needle positioning. If I want the needle off to the left or off to the right, it's just real simple. I, I like the fact that it's that it's very simple. That if I want to sew a zigzag pattern. There's, there's, there's no magic to it. You know, you got to, you know, a couple of, you know, you twist a couple of, and, and you're there. You And you can adjust it. Uh, it's just so simple to use. It reminds me of the real early singers. Uh, that's, you know, that's that's the simplicity of it. And it's rugged. You know, this thing is, uh, you know, I, I, I put magnets on the top of my sewing machines because that's where pins go and whatever else. Uh, rulers, you know, metal rulers, all that sort of stuff. You know, this sort of stuff. It's sure. Around, you know, so it's on top of the machine when I need it. But, uh, you know, in finding a machine that's even got any metal in them today. Oh, yeah. You know, a friend, a friend of mine gave me a, a Singer Touch and Sew, and it's got all the cams, it's got everything to it, and I want to turn it through, and it wouldn't turn through. So I opened it up and of course one of the gears is falling apart and there was a tooth that was done and it was hung up in the grease and I got that out and it sews. And you told me that there are people that, that absolutely love those machines. Yeah, the Amish people are real hot to trot over them. Well, I may, if you want to pay the freight, I may just send you. <laughs> I'm, not real, I'm not real close to the Amish where I'm at now. Uh, when I was further south uh, they were out towards the direction of where my dad was living at the time. So, yeah. uh, but I do, yeah. I, yeah, I really don't have much contact with them any longer. So yeah, West, Western Michigan, uh, when I would go back there, there's always, uh, you know, anytime you see a hitching post at Walmart, you know, you can tell that there's a lot of Amish around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and God bless them. You know, they live a way of life that. I couldn't do. I don't have the desire to do. Some, uh, but, some of the, I was just going to say real quick, just back to your, uh, back to your Viking. Some of the other bragging points that a lot of owners of Vikings will talk about is the slow gear that takes the motor from full power down to one fifth. I'm assuming uh, you have that on your machine, and uh, I've never noticed. <laughs> what's that again? I've never noticed it. One of the things I. You know, I was always used to household machines. If you wanted to wind a bobbin, you would pull the flywheel, you'd pull the balance wheel out uh, and disengage it so you could wind a bobbin. Yep, this is automatic. Well, this is automatic. Yep. And and I'm like, that drove me crazy for a while because, you know, I would, I kept on trying to, and I, all I was doing was, uh, and finally I thought, wait a minute here. And I put a bobbin on there and started to wind them. Going, what in the world is going on? Point, uh, if you would, John, uh, just take your take your machine or your camera, whichever is more convenient, and just point uh, point the right side of the machine at the camera, or uh, grab the camera and point it at the right side of the machine. I just want to see. You should have a you should have a, a bobbin uh, slow gear oh, yeah. winder on there. Let me just see. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's there. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it works good. It, I mean, everything everything works exactly like it should on this machine, uh, except for the motor needs a little help. Other than that, move it. A, yeah, move it a little bit further. I just wanted to see. So you've got. Do you have a bobbin on there right now? No, I don't. No, I don't have a bobbin on there right I'm now. I'm trying to see the. I'm trying to see the. Is there a little black piece? 
There's a little black piece that you yeah, can pull, right? pull out. Yeah, right here. Yeah. No. Did it did it just pull out for you? No, it doesn't. Okay, I can't see I can't see it from there, but a lot of the Type 21s have a have a slow gear, and all you do is take uh, the plastic um, uh, portion of the bobbin winder that kind of sticks out the side of the machine. You just pull it out probably about uh, two or three centimeters. And then what it does is it, it takes that motor uh, down from uh, full power down to one-fifth, no matter how far you push oh. down the foot controller. And oh, I, okay. And it looks like you've got it from what I'm seeing on the side of your machine. If you just grab that, okay. grab where you would slide the bobbin up, grab that little ring and just pull it straight out. It should pull straight out. Well, I'm, I'm pulling on it and it doesn't do anything. Huh. Yeah, it might need to be adjusted, but... Uh, but that assembly that you're, you get, you have the camera pointing at right now, kind of point it down a little bit. Yeah, right there, exactly. Yeah, that, that assembly that is just on the outer fringes of where you would slide the bobbin on, that's got a track that allows that whole assembly to pull straight out. It pulls straight out, and when you pull it, out, pull it straight out, it changes the gear ratio behind that bobbin assembly. And oh, okay. Yeah, and then takes it, takes the machine... Uh, straight down from uh, uh, full power to one-fifth so that you can do slow sewing, you can follow seams very carefully without having to regulate that um, that speed as much. Yeah, you definitely have one, it looks like, from what I'm seeing. Okay. What I'm going to have to do is uh, I'm going to have to get in there and, and see what's going on with it. Maybe uh, you, you know what? I, what happens sometimes, and I'm just looking at the side of your machine, I can't look at the inside, but there is uh, there is oil and other stuff that will caramelize in there and kind of gum things up and yeah you can just yeah. uh, you can just loosen that screw to the right and the one uh, and then take the whole assembly out you have to slide it past the belt you'll have to take off that that top little that top upper piece it's held on by two right screws there. yep you just take the, take that whole thing off and then uh, you can uh, clean that up really good and then you'll be able to enjoy. Uh, that slow gear for certain sewing that you're doing. So yeah, you definitely have one. Yeah, I uh, you see. You know, that's I'm finding out all sorts of stuff about this machine. You know, like I said, but my the main thing I was just absolutely impressed with is the simplicity. Sure, you sure. Know, I've I've never been a real big fan of those household machines, simply because they were, for the most part, they were they weren't made very well, especially the later later ones right right but, uh, you know this was this this machine here is uh it's a sweetheart it's not going anywhere my, uh, <laughs> when I'm, I'm done with it my uh, my middle grandson says uh uh when you're ready to give me those machines i'll take them i'm sure he will <laughs> well that's good that you have that passion continuing to the next generation in the family that's cool yeah. very cool that's a blessing itself his mother, she was, she was, uh, she's a middle child. Uh, she's a, a school teacher, been teaching for 25, 26 years, something like that. Uh, she's done some quilting, and she did it on my mother's treadle machine. She has my mother's treadle machine, and she's done some quilting on that. And I can't think of a, a better machine to do quilting on because of the speed control. I really can't. You know, you can just go, and those things just. They're like butter. They're like these. Yeah, they're so smooth. And, and once you, oh, yeah. once uh, with your technical expertise, once you take out that bobbin assembly and get that all cleaned up and it, and it starts working again, there's a spring in there that causes, when you pull that bobbin assembly out, it causes that gear to pop in and to engage, almost like a 10-speak bike. And, uh, you know, once you experience that slow gear on this Swedish Beauty, oh my goodness you're going to even love it more because it's a fabulous it's a fabulous feature some of the bragging things that people will will point to right away with these swedish beauties is what some of the things you already touched on and that is you don't have to turn a clutch on this it's automatic you slide the bobbin on it disengages the the the, the clutch right away it it's got literally uh with the teflon design and the gear works of the raceway at the other end of the machine it's practically jam-free. You can run heavier thread through it. You can do all kinds of things to try to 
get this machine to jam up and because because that uh, the hook in there kind of floats in and out and up and down it's almost right. impossible almost impossible to jam one of these machines it really is yeah i uh, i've never had a problem with anything jamming i mean ever ever and uh i sh i've shown uh uh pretty heavy thread with it all the time i mean i don't very seldom does it ever have regular cotton, uh, you know, normal household thread on. I mean, I've got a bunch of it. If I, you know, if I need to hem something up or I need to do something, I, you know, I've certainly got about 20 different colors of thread to do it with. But it's just that for the most part, it gets commercial. It gets commercial. You know, 164 is what I usually run in it, and it just shows like a dream. Yeah, and most machines would just gum up and and crash and burn if you tried putting heavier thread like that what kind of needles uh, what kind of needles do you run in it uh you know these are just uh regular singer needles that uh that i happen to have uh from my wife's uh for the for one of the other machines inside the house it's the same needle that that i run in this uh other husqvarna that uh that i got matter of fact the neighbor guy that lives across the street had thrown it away it was a brand new machine still in the case he said he, he was sewing kites with it it didn't sew that good and so i'm like ah and so that I you said that, that that's started. a that's a much newer machine isn't it that's newer than your yeah it is. It yeah, is. yeah. When, he, when, when i when i when i picked it out of his garbage it had uh, three packages of needles with it and i'm like huh i can always use needles you know, most most problems that happen with sewing machines, I think uh, people break a needle, they get a burr on a sewing hook, and the next thing you know, they got some thread, you know, that's getting shredded, you know, those sort of things, or it's a tension problem. Uh, I've never had a needle strike with this where, uh, where, you know, where it didn't feed right and didn't, you know, it just, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, they're fabulous machines, and... Uh... And with, with basic maintenance, kind of like you talked about, you know, a little bit of oil periodically, but not too much oil. And other, right. you know, basic maintenance things, keeping the lint, you know, from packing out too much in the hook area. You know, basic things yeah. like that. And uh, and keeping, you know, keeping it just in general good repair. Uh, I mean, they, they just run and run and run and run once they're up and going. So. Yeah, I, uh, every now and then I take the air compressor and blow the lint out of all out of all the machines and it just you know it just keeps them going you know and if you put too much oil in them it turns into a problem and things start getting gummed up absolutely so. absolutely well i am I, yeah i'm really appreciative for the opportunity to chat about uh your time in the navy your time at nasa and uh just a little bit more about your own machine and i'm glad that you know, we we didn't plan it. You know, even if people think we did, I didn't. We didn't plan to explore your machine a little bit, and now you've learned something new about your machine that's going to probably uh, take you into the evening, as you're saying. I'm going to take this sucker apart and get it going, and and see what that slow gear is all about. So, as a matter of fact, I'll figure that out within the hour. I I wouldn't be surprised at all, knowing you. I wouldn't be surprised. As a matter of fact, it may happen much sooner than that. It may happen while we're still talking. <laughs> I'm going to put my trusty screwdriver away. I'm not going to mess with it. Well, I am uh, very grateful for your time, grateful to your wife as well that she uh, allowed you to kind of break away and do this and, and probably helped you a little bit getting the iPad setting up as well and getting it, you know, We've had we've had just incredible streaming. It's it's incredible. We haven't had any breaks. We haven't had any video disconnects or anything like that. So that in in it that in and of itself is a miracle. I think so. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not all that familiar with some of the technology. I share that with you. Well, I'm, that's uh, that's okay. Your partner is able to jump in and fill that gap for you. Yeah, you know, and I figured it out, Scott. I'm not really part of the social network. If I'm not careful, though, I'll become part of the anti-social network. So <laughs> it's, sure. it's, important, it's, a, it's important that uh, that uh, I think it's important for, for us as, as human beings to, to communicate. And uh, this pandemic has got 
all the makings of a real disaster just on the people not communicating. So, what is Scott, I got to go, brother. Let me let me ask you a quick question. What what does that yellow sign say uh, behind you over your left shoulder? Oh yeah, I spent a lot of time duck hunting too. That's a Duckaholics Anonymous. Son. Oh, Duckaholics Anonymous. That's awesome. Hey, let me turn the camera. Let me turn the camera around real quick, because uh, Mr. Bean and Herr Obermeister want to wave goodbye to you. Hey, and I see, I see Dr. Singer's there too. Yep, he's kind of hiding behind that. Uh, I see him back there with the stethoscope. Yep, that 1885, and see, he he thought he could hide, but you you saw him. Yeah, that's a fellow military person. You 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 notice all the details, see? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you'll have to you'll have to watch for the premiere on this uh, 1885, so you can, because uh, uh, especially with your mechanics background and your tech your technician knowledge and everything, you'll really enjoy watching this thing operate. It's so smooth and so quiet when it's sewing even when i was testing leather and stuff like that on it it just it just zips through just I zips through you've never sewn on a hand crank no i never have yeah well if you ever come to wisconsin i'll i'll have one set up for you well that may that may happen cuz i've got a real good friend uh it's up in uh, up in Iowa. Pat Tyne is up there, and uh, yeah, he's uh, him and his wife both spent a lot of time behind sewing machines. Uh, another Navy buddy of mine, retired, sure. fellow retired petty officer, and uh, yeah. Scott, well, you, it's been my brother. Yeah, my it's been a pleasure, and again, I'm grateful and. Uh, just keep an eye open. I'm I'm guessing that this will probably we're already on Monday. This will probably air on uh, Wednesday. I'm guessing we'll go live with this. And uh, if you're able to join, I, I if you're able to join, if it doesn't conflict with your golfing or anything like that, I usually do them around 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Your time. Okay. So. Uh, I, should be, I should be awake by then. You should be awake by then. <laughs> Daylight, you get down about ten o'clock in the morning. You come home and you get a shower, you know, and a little bite to eat. Every now and then, it's it's you know naps are good. They're really good. I'm a firm believer in naps. Actually, I think, and and they've shown medically that people that do take like midday naps, they're healthier, they get sick less, and they live longer. So it's a it's a good practice to get into. Oh, I'm all over that. I'll, I'll even I'll write. I'll I'll write that down for you. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, brother. All right, God bless you. Take care. Yep. God bless. Yep, be well. Well, that was a fabulous treat, wasn't it? An absolute fabulous treat. I've got to see if I can I'm kind of tucked in here. I got to see if I can get myself back out with without falling over the the tripod now. So that was John John Smith from Florida, and uh, what a neat guy and and uh, and humble as well. Uh, you know all the great experiences that he's been fortunate enough to uh, to have. He just doesn't see it uh, as a big deal. He doesn't see it as anything that's extraordinary. Uh, actually, I'm going to back this up a little bit further. He doesn't see it as anything that's extraordinary. He doesn't see it as anything that's exceptional. Uh, and I love that quality in folks. You know the saying, humility is a strange thing. The moment you think you have it, you lost it. And uh, John does not have that problem. He's a very humble man. Um, and he probably, I'm not going to say this for sure. I'm not going to say this for sure. But I am guessing, just guessing, that he probably remembered every single astronaut, because the guy's got a mind that's sharper than a tack. He probably remembered every single astronaut that he ever met when he was at NASA. And some that he probably even gave tours to when he got into that management role. But did you notice? He didn't go into that. He didn't start bragging about, yeah, I, I took Neil Armstrong or I took this astronaut or whoever it was back in the time that he was there for those 13, 14 years. 
uh, he didn't feel com compelled at all to brag about those things. Uh, just a wonderful, uh, servant-minded uh, type leader. And I think that that quality is, uh, is fabulous, don't you? And uh, also about his uh, time in the Navy, you know, he, he shared the events that happened on that, um, on that particular uh, aircraft carrier when the, the bombs were going off and everything, and he didn't break off into a story about, you know, that was braggiosis or anything like that. He just told the facts as they were and what happened and, and kind of moved on with, uh, you know, other things after that. So I just think that he's been such a delight, uh, you know, to visit with uh, off camera and certainly on camera as well. I hope you've enjoyed the interview. And uh, in his honor, I've got to end with another naval song as well. And uh, I hope he enjoys it because uh, now that we've uh, disconnected, he's not going to see this until this live premiere. So I'm going to see if I can put on one more naval song that uh, I think he'll enjoy. I did the, uh, the band only one. Now I'm going to do the choral one, which I think is absolutely fabulous. And this is the United States Naval, um, United States Navy Choir or Choral Group uh, singing this piece. And I played this for you before. I played this before you, for you before. I can hear you singing, Dr. Singer. A special salute to my newfound friend John Smith down in Florida and uh, just a reminder to all of you that follow things very closely on this YouTube channel and on Facebook as well uh, with Mary Klein's 1885 singer 12k behind me that I'm prepping like I told John I'm prepping it now to get it ready for a premiere and then it's going to be mailed off to Mary Klein and again, if you're brand new to this channel, every time we gain another 1,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, we do a major contest giveaway. Prior to this, it was a 201-2, the Rolls-Royce of singer sewing machines. Prior to that, it was 185Ks, 185Js, 99Ks. Uh, we just continue, I continue to want to give away machines because when you gain 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, in a niche space like vintage sewing machines, even sewing in general, that's huge. Gaining a thousand subscribers in a niche space like vintage sewing machines is like getting 10,000 subscribers on some more, you know, contemporary type, pop culture type uh, channel that might be on YouTube. So it's a huge accomplishment. It's a huge uh, milestone that I could not even begin to take any credit for. It's about all of you. All of you, number one, clicking subscribe and then going out and telling your friends, your family, other folks that are involved or interested in vintage things, sewing, quilting, appliques, whatever it is. 
you help spread the word and through that multiplication of you telling one person that goes on and tells two more and then those two people tell four more and then four more people tell ten more that's how we're able to gain so many subscribers so rapidly on a continuous basis like this it really is amazing it blows me away like I was saying to John just in that interview I went crazy almost did a little dance when I way back when when we hit 300 subscribers and now we're gaining about 300 subscribers every month and with only about a hundred more subscribers to go until our next milestone of 9,000 subscribers that's gonna happen really quick Hans and I are behind the scenes preparing and planning and trying to work out the framework of this next contest that if you follow me faithfully you already know we're going to be traveling to Norway in a sense and Hans is going to help guide this next contest and he's already working with me behind the scenes put together all the framework what do you need to do what uh, specific things do you have to speak to in the next creative piece that you write all of those particulars we're hammering it out behind the scenes right now and trying to stay up with the pace of these new subscribers being gained so quickly but still and I'm gonna go back to ground zero here still when I look at the analytics behind the scenes that I can see 80 percent I think 82 percent of the people that visit this YouTube channel and watch a ton of videos they never click subscribe. That's got to be the one of the one of the greatest mysteries of life that I hope I don't take to the grave. I hope I I hope I can figure it out long before then. Why do folks come to this channel and watch a ton of videos but they never click click subscribe so that they can be in that VIP circle and receive firsthand notifications when a new premiere is announced, when a video is posted, when an impromptu video is uh, released. Uh, all of those things you get on the fast track you get in that VIP circle when you click subscribe so if you're watching this right now and you're not a subscriber yet why why have you not clicked subscribe yet do it get in that VIP circle so that as soon as a premiere is released on YouTube as it's pending and kind of queued up and we're waiting for it to go live you're going to know about it already. You're not going to find about it. You're not going to find out about it after the fact and go, "Dang, I that was that was a machine I definitely would love to have asked questions about in that live chat." Remember the way YouTube has set it up now and I think it's brilliant. As we're watching that premiere live, as it's being released for the first time for all of us to watch it together around the world. On the right side of that page, is a live chat in real time where you can chime in and ask questions you can make comments you can post smiley faces if you see something happen on the screen that you're really excited about you can even and this has happened recently I actually forgot it was there but with this new format of premieres you can even make a donation if you want to and I'm not I'm not shamelessly making a plug about that but when you look at the very bottom of that chat you can click and get emojis and other fun things that you can post to make emphasis about whatever you're typing in the chat and then just to the right of it there's another one you can click and you can actually make a donation why do I bring that up I guess I bring it up because in order to have a mission you have to have a margin and I've been extremely fortunate extremely blessed to have a lot of folks that make that investment and send machines to the workshop for me to restore, to repair, uh, to do a variety of things that need to be done. Maybe to just optimize that machine and give it renewed power back. Remember John mentioning that he's really hoping these motor brushes that I just sent him for his free Westinghouse motor that's in his Swedish Beauty. He's hoping that that'll do the job. Otherwise, he's you know basically hinted at maybe you know maybe I'm gonna have to send you that machine or that motor so you can do your magic and give it its give it its give it its power back give power back to that motor that's been lost over the years or over time or for whatever reason and so through all those different avenues I, I have been very fortunate uh, to have the margin to have a mission
But when folks will surprise me sometimes during a premiere and click that little donation thing at the bottom of the chat, and you know make a dollar donation or one person very recently just blew me away they made a five five dollar donation which all of a sudden will give me a, a bigger uh, base to do even more things that I love doing to make this channel interesting educational and fun so not trying to make a plug for that at all but if you decide to surprise me during a live premiere and make a donation God bless you that really will make a difference so that I can hopefully eventually as well get back to my asbestos exploratory remember that where i was talking about foot controllers motors and other things that may have had asbestos back in the day uh, and i'm sure john could speak to that now with all the insights he's had uh, over the years learning about those different naval vessels that he was on that probably were packed out with asbestos but one of the things i'm hoping to do if you're new to this channel or if you've forgotten about it is I'm hoping to send some samples. I already have the sample kit. I'm hoping to send those samples out to this place in New Jersey, I believe it was, and get them to test it on these various foot controllers, these motors that I'll take swabs of, and then let us know decisively, you know, is there asbestos in some of those old Singer motors, in those old foot controllers? Because there's a lot of, a lot of rumor milling on the internet about that and a lot of it is inaccurate by the way but uh, all of those things you know whether you make the effort of packing up a machine or a motor and a foot controller and sending it into the workshop that all ties into giving me that margin so that this mission can continue and so that the wheels can keep turning at the workshop and I can keep doing what I love doing and you can keep enjoying watching what you love watching and that is these fun uh, you know videos uh, highlighting different machines that you may be intrigued about that you've never heard something about it before looking on this live premiere right here as I'm interviewing John Smith he never knew that his Swedish beauty his type 21 had a slow gear on it and that's why I do what I do is so that through our classroom up oh, I didn't even do it did I <laughs> through our classroom we can continue to learn together and it's not a one-sided deal I learn things all the time from all of you I learn things all the time look at recently as I was presenting uh, Mary Rowan's FOF 339 there was a wonderful gentleman that has now become a friend and by the way if he's watching right now I would love to see if he would consider or be interested in maybe joining Hans and Bill and myself as a moderator. Now there is a shameless plug. And uh, I would love to see if that would be a possibility because as we pull all of this wealth of experience and knowledge together, many of you recently saw uh, Hans Christian's second letter. And he went into some great depth sharing uh, his newfound passion and respect for the Singer Featherweights and also shared a bunch of great information about the Featherweight 221s and the 222s. How cool would it be to have a wonderful resource like this gentleman in Germany that shared his knowledge about that forward reverse uh, function on the 339 where I'd kind of misspoken about the reverse and then he shared in German what that actually translates to. Wouldn't it be great to have a, a great resource like Hans in relation to Swedish beauties, a great resource like this gentleman in Germany as a resource there for the uh, Foff sewing machines, and then having Bill with his expansive knowledge of so many things to do with restoration and Singer sewing machines in general as a resource there, and then all the experience that I can bring as well. We would be we've been the three amigos we would be the four amigos that would just blow the socks off of people with being able to be there as a resource behind the scenes and in front of the scenes being able to share insights about a wide scope of sewing machines so again if my friend from germany that helped me out advising me about the reverse function would consider having a discussion about joining hans and bill and myself as a moderator 
so that you can operate behind the scenes and help answer questions and be a knowledge resource and also eventually start posting things like Bill and Hans have been doing to educate people on the German culture, German sewing machines, all that different stuff that we would maybe forget to, to dig into. And you're right there in Germany and you can dig into it uh, and be a resource, you know, a first-hand resource that would be so valuable to the folks that follow us on YouTube and follow us on Facebook as well. That would be fabulous. Wouldn't that be fabulous? Shameless plug, shameless plug, shameless plug. So uh, with that, I'm going to call this class complete and thank John Smith again for the incredible things that he shared uh, and also, you know, his experiences at NASA in the Navy and everything else. And I will end this by saying thank you, John. The bell's actually ringing before class is officially over. Thank you, John, for your service. Uh, and for all that you've done for this country through NASA, through the Navy, and everything else. And I just hope you continue to fall in love with your Swedish beauty as you learn more great things about it and as you continue to probably collect other machines down there in Florida as well. So with that, class is over. Thanks for watching. And God bless.